Tonight, allegations of abuse and harassment at all levels of the Assembly of First Nations. Bullying at the hands of some elders and knowledge keepers who know they are protected. What an independent investigation found. What it says has to happen. The Bank of Canada hikes the interest rate again. We haven't seen it this high in more than two decades. I want to know, like, at what point does it stop? Do people have to be forced out of their houses? A source of chronic infection hiding in the dirt. Lauren Pelly digs into the dangers of valley fever. Once it moves beyond the lungs, then you're in for a very rocky ride. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. Two stories tonight detail allegations of sexual abuse on a mass scale. In a moment, a case in Nova Scotia, police say might have 200 victims. But first, a bombshell report presented to the Assembly of First Nations detailing alleged misconduct inside the organization at every level. Tonight, the AFN is grappling with the finding that its own members engaged in harassment and gender-based discrimination. This coming to light just a day after it rejected a bid to reinstate its first female national chief. Olivia Stefanovic is at the AFN's annual General Assembly tonight, where some members say these revelations aren't surprising. Sexual harassment, bullying, lateral violence, viewed by many, are told that that's normal. In a convention centre full of First Nations leaders, the three women in charge of an independent review laid out their findings widespread gender-based discrimination within the Assembly of First Nations. Bullying at the hands of some elders and knowledge keepers who know they are protected by their own position and by others who are in positions of power made those impacted feel helpless and unheard. From harassment to unwanted sexting, examples of abusive behavior, Pulling a person into an unwanted hug and not wanting to let go. Touching someone's hair without consent or permission. For many women, official validation of what they face. I'm concerned for my daughters. I'm concerned for the future generations that are coming up. Ali Bear says she faced hostility to become one of the youngest AFN leaders. I think there's a lot of, still as a woman, people don't take you seriously despite being educated, a lawyer, a mother, having lived experience. The interim AFN national chief visibly moved by the weight of the findings. I assure the AFN will continue to take steps necessary to make these changes. The promise comes one day after the AFN rejected a bid to reinstate Roseanne Archibald, the first female national chief who called out misogyny and helped spark the review. I'm very grateful for uh, these types of resolutions. For those who've tried to address sexual violence head on, they hope the report brings in a new era. I face consequences um, because of that. And um, so that is part of the fear in terms of addressing this. Olivia, how does the AFN plan to move forward? Well, Ian, the new interim national chief, Joanna Bernard, says she plans to introduce a new way to report harassment and implement a zero-tolerance workplace policy. But what's still unclear is how the AFN plans to address one of the report's main recommendations to end the use of non-disclosure agreements, which are used, according to the report, to silence those who come forward. Another challenge, Ian, is that any changes will also have to grapple with internal resistance. Olivia Stefanovic reporting from Halifax tonight. RCMP in Nova Scotia have announced a large-scale sexual abuse investigation. Operation Headwind has identified 70 potential victims at a youth correctional facility. And as Chris O'Neill Yates explains, that could be just the beginning. Sexual assault investigations are complex, and Operation Headwind is no exception. Complex because of the sheer numbers of men who say they were abused at the provincial-run Nova Scotia Youth Centre, with allegations spanning from 1988, the year it opened, all the way to 2017. Investigators have taken statements from more than 70 survivors, and at this time, we believe there may be more than 200. We are seeking more information, and we are very hopeful other survivors will connect with us 
The investigation stems from a class action lawsuit filed in 2019 against the Nova Scotia government on behalf of three men who were between 16 and 18 at the time. They allege abuse, including sexual assault, unwanted touching and sexual touching, and improper viewing while undressing in change rooms. In its notice of defense, the province identified Donald Douglas Williams, a swim instructor who worked at the youth facility from 1988 and left in 2017. In these new allegations, the RCMP did not name a suspect. When we get to a point where there is an arrest and charges made, the that uh, information will be public then. The RCMP have launched a confidential hotline encouraging people to come forward if they have allegations. A difficult step for abuse survivors, says a lawyer for the alleged victims in the class action suit. And the RCMP, to their credit, have, have worked really well in this area and have fostered trust with uh, the first few people who have had the courage to come forward, um, and, and that thankfully has snowballed. None of the allegations have been proven in court. In a statement, the Nova Scotia government says it reported the allegations to the RCMP when it became aware of them and will continue to cooperate in this investigation. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. To Canada's economy now, the Bank of Canada raising its key interest rate yet again. It's a move many analysts were predicting and even more mortgage holders have been dreading. The rate ticked up 25 basis points and now stands at 5%. And even though that's a two-decade high, there is no guarantee the hikes are over. For borrowers, today's announcement will have an immediate impact. And as Philippe de Montigny shows us, many were already at a breaking point. Lena Shandy purchased this townhouse seven years ago in Vancouver's largest suburb. Her mortgage payments have just about doubled since. Just a little bit under half my paycheck. I want to know, like, at what point does it stop? Like, do people have to be forced out of their houses? The Bank of Canada raised its key interest rate by another 25 basis points, hitting 5% for the first time in 22 years. Past interest rate increase Governor increase Tiff Macklem says core inflation remains stubbornly high and points to signs of excess demand in the economy. We know that if we don't do enough now, uh, we'll likely have to do even more later. Um, we also know, though, that if we do more than we need now, it's going to be unnecessarily painful which some homeowners say is already the case. It's not only difficult, it's impossible uh, to, uh, to upgrade from uh, $700 per, per month, so we extend the amortization. From 25 years to 40 years, he says. This is the 10th rate hike in less than a year and a half, all aimed at taming inflation. But now mortgage costs have become the biggest contributor. This economist says that's a price the Bank of Canada is willing to pay. You're going to have to uh, concede some inflation in some areas in order to extract this inflation elsewhere. They're hoping that uh, this will demand households uh, to make sacrifices in their budgets and to cut back on really the non-essential type of spending. Even with such cutbacks, the central bank says the economy can avoid a major downturn. In our forecast, there is a path back to price stability with while maintaining growth. So there is there is no recession. The Bank of Canada now expects to reach its 2% inflation target by the middle of 2025. That's about half a year later than it previously projected. And to get there, the central bank isn't ruling out more rate hikes. Philippe de Monsigny, CBC News, Toronto. As you've seen, this is pain piled on top of pain for many Canadians. And as Kate McKenna explains, political parties are weighing in to cast blame. Across the country and party lines, everyone agrees. Look, this is not the news that any Canadian wanted to receive this morning. The Bank of Canada's latest interest rate hike will hurt. I understand what they're doing, trying to knock down inflation, but what's the ramification of this? When these people have to renew their mortgages and they can't afford it? For British Columbia, it's... Uh, it's very similar to Ontario. You know, this is devastating news for families that have debt. And the worst may be yet to come, as families that borrowed at record low rates need to renew their mortgages. So there's a long road to go. Monetary policy takes time. 
The Bank of Canada operates independently of the federal government, but that didn't stop federal opposition parties from playing the blame game. The Conservatives accusing the Prime Minister of doing too little to stop the inflation that's driving the bank's action. Rates have gone from 0.25 all the way up to 5%, an absolutely astounding increase, 20 times higher than they were just over a year ago. These rates are obviously set by the Bank of Canada, but the culprit is Justin Trudeau. Other jurisdictions the NDP says more needs to be done to rein in corporate gas. profits. We need to show corporate Canada that if they're going to be punishing Canadians with unreasonable prices, that they're not going to get to keep that money. The Liberals defended their policies. People around the world are facing significant challenges. That's why in Canada, uh, we've stepped up with targeted support for people who most need it at this moment. Inflation is being felt globally, but as Canadians struggle to pay their bills, political parties are eager to position themselves as the most affordable option. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. And there's some good news stateside when it comes to the cost of living. The U.S. rate of inflation eased to 3% in June. That's its lowest pace since March of 2021. But food's still one of the major outliers, sticking closer to 6%. And economists still expect the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates later this month. Canada's Food Inspection Agency is recalling several caffeinated drinks, including a popular one called Prime Energy. It has six times the amount of caffeine found in a Coke. As Alison Northcott shows us, the big concern is for young people who can easily get their hands on them. On full display at this store in Montreal, Prime Energy is a popular, highly caffeinated drink. We got Prime, boys. It's promoted to millions of followers by YouTube stars Logan Paul and KSI, and we found it in several Canadian stores and online. If you Google where to buy Prime Energy in Canada, this is one of the websites that comes up. I'm going to choose this one. It's Blue Raspberry. The cans we found contain 200 milligrams of caffeine, more than Health Canada allows. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says it's aware that some stores in Canada may be selling Prime Energy without approval and that a decision to recall has been made based on a health risk assessment. I've been following this drink for some time, just waiting for it to arrive in Canada. It's, Jim it's Shepard's 15-year-old son, Brian, died from a sudden arrhythmia in 2008. What caused his heart to stop remains unexplained, but Shepard suspects an energy drink played a role. He's been advocating for more regulations ever since. If I was a regulator, I would have been proactive about this. I would have been already sending out um, a notification that these drinks aren't permitted across the border. Too much caffeine, especially in individuals with low body weights, is problematic. This expert says a lot of children and teens are consuming these drinks. Energy drinks have companies are, have been largely in charge here, and the Canadian government needs to do more in terms of getting a handle on what's in the market. Prime says its drinks are within the legal limits of the countries they're sold in and says it has a Canadian version with less caffeine. This food law expert says the unlawful drinks can end up here in a few ways, from distributors or e-commerce sites based in other countries to sellers bringing it across the border from the U.S. If you sort of picture the amount of goods that come into Canada on any given day, it's really difficult to police this sort of thing. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency is also recalling several other brands of energy drinks for violating the rules around caffeine content and labeling requirements. It says consequences can range from a warning to prosecution. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Several homes in a California city continue to slowly sink into a ravine, displacing at least 17 people. This section of Rolling Hills Estates near Los Angeles is both a catastrophe for homeowners and a geological mystery. After the ground began to give way, the buildings collapsed. Movement has slowed, but it's not clear when this will stop. Tens of millions in the U.S. are enduring sweltering temperatures tonight. Excessive heat is punishing the Southwest. Paul Hunter shows us the dangerous impacts. In the U.S. Southwest, it is beyond the pale, scorching. Phoenix, Arizona, typically a hot spot any summer, just hit 43 Celsius. On Saturday, it'll be 48. The city has set up hundreds of cooling centers and water stations. It's life-saving. 
mean, people are not used to this kind of thing for this many days in a row. We have seen episodes like this from time to time, but this is one that's, uh, that's been extreme even by Phoenix standards. Phoenix is hardly alone in the heat. This weekend, it's expected to be in the high 40s throughout the Southwest. In Death Valley, it's expected to crack 51. As climate change continues to intensify weather systems, some 80 million Americans are now under heat advisories. In Miami, the heat index has been above 37 for 30 straight days. Even the water temperature off the Florida Keys is now in the mid-30s. Among those caught in the heat, migrants still trying to cross into the U.S. So far this year, more than 100 have died from the heat after crossing in, 53 in Arizona alone, including last weekend, a woman. This man had walked up to them and said that his sister had died the night before. All of this as they continue the cleanup and assess the damage from that rainstorm in the Northeast this week with more rain expected within days threatening further disaster. In the U.S. Capitol, caught between the heat to the south and those storms to the north, a respite of a kind. With a slight breeze in the air, it was merely 34. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. After days of speculation in Britain, the identity of the BBC host facing allegations of paying a young person for explicit images has been revealed. Hugh Edwards. The ceremony was steeped in tradition. Reflecting the, the name of the well-known BBC personality was made public by his wife. The BBC suspended him because of the allegations he paid for images of a young person starting when they were 17. But police say there are no indications Edwards committed a criminal offence. An internal investigation at the BBC continues. The NATO summit in Lithuania has come to a close, and the core issue of how far the alliance will go to support Ukraine in its fight against Russia's invasion has a new answer. Ukraine may not have a path into NATO yet, but Evan Dyer shows the critical commitments it did receive. Volodymyr Zelensky looked a lot happier today after a day of disappointingly lukewarm commitments from NATO yesterday. Ukrainian delegation is bringing home significant security victory for the Ukraine, for our country, for our people. The G7, the world's most powerful democracies, including non-NATO member Japan, agreed to each offer Ukraine security guarantees. And the core of these security guarantees is multi-year commitments to continue to be there for Ukraine. Vladimir Putin wants to uh, wait out and grind down the alliance, grind down Ukrainians, well, he's not going to be able to because we will be there for as long as it takes. But the security guarantees offered by G7 countries deliberately fall short of a promise to defend Ukraine with their own troops. That's because once one NATO member gets embroiled with Russia, it would automatically drag every other NATO country into the war. So any security guarantee like the one the U.S. has to defend South Korea from attack is off the table. But it could look more like the arrangement the U.S. has with Israel, which includes guaranteed multi-year contributions to its defense budget. Of course, Ukraine isn't only looking for future guarantees, but also for arms and ammunition it needs right now. NATO has already provided weapons it once said were too provocative, including American HIMARS rockets and Canadian Leopard tanks. Now Zelensky says he's in talks with Washington to get Attackham's ballistic missiles with a range of 300 kilometers. And as the summit opened, France pledged cruise missiles. Both weapons are capable of hitting targets deep inside Russia and Crimea, currently beyond the reach of Ukrainian weapons. And Canada announced its intention to join with 10 other nations to train Ukrainian pilots to fly F-16 fighter jets, another red line NATO was until recently unwilling to cross. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Vilnius. Back here at home, BC port workers and their employer have just hours left to consider recommendations made by a mediator aimed at ending the 12-day-old strike. The federal government made the call to bring that mediator in. This is hard work. This takes time. It just can't take too much time. And it was taking too much time. That's why I made the decision that I did. They have until 10.30 a.m. Pacific time Thursday to respond to the recommended settlement. The Labour Minister says he's confident they'll accept it, but won't say what happens if they don't. 
The economic pain that work stoppage is causing was made clear by Canada's premiers today on the final day of their meetings in Winnipeg. As Ashley Burke explains, today's main focus was on infrastructure and a request to the Prime Minister. Good morning. After three days of meetings in Winnipeg, the collective ask from the premiers is for another meeting. Premiers are calling on the Prime Minister for a dedicated First Minister's meeting on these critical infrastructure priorities. The Prime Minister already told big city mayors money is on the way this fall to address the housing crisis across Canada. But the premiers want that funding to come to them instead. So we still need the help of the federal government, but we think that it should respect our jurisdiction. 504,000 people landed in Ontario, fastest growing jurisdiction in all of North America, bar none. And what comes with the housing is infrastructure. Business groups told the premiers, yes, Canada needs more housing, but that's not all. What we need is a national trade corridor infrastructure plan. We're just not keeping pace. They say Canada's struggle to move goods and people across the country is hurting its ability to stay competitive. 67% of our GDP comes from trade. And if you look at where Canada ranks in the rest of the world, we've fallen from 10th to about 30th. What do we want? Contract. The port strike in BC, a key example of what's at stake, a major disruption costing millions of dollars a day. This is incumbent upon the federal government. They are responsible for ports under the Constitution, and they, they, they do have to make sure that they're understanding that these kinds of jobs are essential. It's not clear if that meeting with the Prime Minister about infrastructure will happen. CBC News asked his office and was told that the Intergovernmental Affairs Minister already regularly speaks to premiers about a range of issues, including infrastructure. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Winnipeg. Olivia Chow has now made history, becoming Toronto's first racialized mayor. Toronto's story is also my story. A journey that took me from Hong Kong to an apartment in St. Jamestown, and now to this council chamber as your new mayor. After being sworn in, Chow named some of the major issues she plans to tackle. They include the city's housing crisis, the growing crime rates, and concerns over public transit. There's also the matter of Toronto's $1 billion budget shortfall. Major movies are hitting theaters this summer, but blockbuster audiences are not showing up. Why big bunch of movies are struggling to sell tickets. It will be the first year that they don't have a billion dollar movie at the box office. The extraordinary new image of a star being born. Oh my God. Oh, wow. And the unexpected visitor that overwhelmed onlookers. I cried and I looked around and there was definitely a lot of tears. Oh, hello baby. We're back in two. Nominations are out for the 75th Annual Emmy Awards and one television network and its top shows stand out. I love you, but you are not serious people. HBO's mega-hit Succession walked away with a whopping 27 nominations for its final season. The drama made history with three actors in the same category. You trust me? Other shows with more than 20 nominations include HBO's The Last of Us, Apple TV's Ted Lasso, and another HBO hit. Welcome to the White Lotus in Sicily. That distinctive theme song from the White Lotus also earned its Canadian composer a nomination. Other notable Canadian nominees, Martin Short for Only Murders in the Building, and Luke Kirby for the final season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I'm in. It's showtime! The Emmy Awards are set to take place September 18th with a caveat. The ongoing writer's strike could have an impact. This year is supposed to be a big return for blockbuster movies after the pandemic restrictions, but it has been a bumpy ride. Many movies have not sold the number of tickets studios were banking on. Jackson Weaver looks at whether the recent flops will change what we see on screen. Action star Tom Cruise has an optimistic catchphrase. But as his seventh Mission Impossible film launches, just ahead of heavyweights Barbie and Oppenheimer, there's a worrying trend. Can we talk about what's going on with the box office right now? Here's a taste. 
Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny will likely earn its studio less than half its cost. I'm an idiot. Shazam! Fury of the Gods failure prompted star Zachary Levi to beg fans to go see it. Um, go see Shazam! Fury of the Gods. And The Flash is being called the biggest superhero flop of all time. Just the amount of consecutive kind of disappointments that are coming out from these major movies with these very inflated budgets. Um, I think that's what's making it so jarring. I want to be where the people are. But inflated expectations could be what's, for example, pushing Disney toward its worst non-COVID year in nearly a decade. It will be the first year that they don't have a billion dollar movie at the box office, most likely. And it's kind of astounding to think that a billion dollars has become, is it a success or is it a flop? He was born into the world of the rich and powerful. Historically though, flops have had one obvious silver lining, telling studios what audiences don't want. Take the infamous Heaven's, Heaven's Gate. Gate. That's the white whale of all flops. The 1980 bomb essentially ended the era of big budget art films, setting us up for the popcorn fair we have now. Comment down below the name of a big flop. But this flop historian says, with the rise of streaming services, a movie tanking at the box office means less. And that's on purpose. If a studio has a choice, they're not going to set up a second paradigm where they have to constantly announce that these plans backfire or the, these embarrassing uh, flops. So if you were hoping your ticket purchases might discourage more superheroes and remakes, the studios may not be listening. Jackson Weaver, CBC News, Toronto. A rare infection is spreading across the U.S. and it could eventually make its way to Canada. It's super easy to, to, to inhale. Uh, that's kind of a scary thing. Why it's often overlooked and hard to treat. Once it moves beyond the lungs, uh, then you're in for a very rocky ride. And the impact of another rate hike. I think that people are going to lose their houses. Our senior business correspondent explains why even he was surprised. I had somehow convinced myself that the bank was going to pause. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. In parts of the U.S., a dangerous fungus lurks in the dirt, causing a disease called valley fever. And it's creeping closer to Canada. Lauren Pelly joins a team of scientists in Arizona trying to find out where its hotspots are and showing us a health threat potentially coming our way. In Arizona, the saying goes like this, everything in the desert is trying to kill you. One of the biggest threats here is invisible, a potentially deadly fungus hiding in the dirt. I suppose it's everywhere. It's super easy to, to, to inhale. Uh, that's kind of a scary thing. Jesse Abair thinks he got infected soon after moving to Arizona a few years ago, because not long after, strange things started happening in his body. It was simply physical exhaustion. Almost inexplicably, like, you just, I just felt like I felt like I hadn't eaten in like two or three days. 27 years old at the time, Abair was caught off guard by the extreme fatigue. He also started coughing up blood. At first I was like kind of unnerved. And then when I started thinking, oh, I might be dealing with a cancer or something, I got actually pretty terrified. Doctors told him he had valley fever, the disease caused by coccidioides, or coxie. That fungus lives in the dirt, and people can inhale it through windswept desert dust. It infects at least 20,000 Americans each year, and thanks to climate change, it's spreading. On the dusty trails of Granite Mountain Trailhead in Scottsdale, Arizona, this research team is trying to track it down by collecting soil samples. If we're going to a site that we don't know is positive and we're going to a new site, we're kind of just shooting in the dark. Marika Ramsey is a research associate at Northern Arizona University. So we're going to be finding a spot now. Like, do you have a spot yes. in mind? Um, I do have one right over here. It's okay. next to some of the restoration plots. I did sample this back um, in, I believe it was 2021 as well as 2022. Okay. So something like this is what we look for. 
Ramsey says studies suggest a good spot to check for the coxie fungus are rodent burrows, where the soil has already been disturbed. She puts on protective gear to avoid breathing in any dust. Then the method to actually collect the dirt is nothing fancy, just old spoons and sample cups. Usually this is kind of like the amount that we get, because um, we don't need a whole lot of soil um, for our extraction. At new sampling sites, teams like this can be here for a couple of hours, and sometimes they'll take up to a hundred of those tiny cups of soil just to try and find even one sample of the valley fever fungus. We later joined Ramsey back on campus and put on our own protective gear before heading to the lab. So how did, how did collections go uh, yesterday? It went really well in the morning. Here, Ramsey and other scientists sift through the soil samples to find fungal spores, all under the watchful eye of longtime valley fever researcher Bridget Barker. She says work to better understand the coxie fungus is crucial as infection rates are rising while its range is expanding. With climate change potentially impacting more and more people across the western United States, potentially even into Canada. One recent study used climate projections to model the range of valley fever in the decades ahead. It found rising temperatures and shifting rainfall patterns could allow the fungus to keep spreading north, all the way to the Canadian border before the end of the century. As you increase temperatures in the environment, you sort of pre-adapt these infectious diseases to being able to tolerate higher and higher temperatures. This is what the fungus looks like on a petri dish. If we could see into the soil and actually observe the organism growing, we'd see these fine white threads. And when it's inhaled, it causes chaos. Each spore inflates like a beach ball filled with smaller ping pong balls. Once the large spheres rupture, the smaller balls are released, then the cycle repeats over and over again, aggravating the lungs, leading to fatigue, fever, and other flu-like symptoms, sometimes for months on end. In other cases, it spreads through the body, causing infections that can last a lifetime. Once it moves beyond the lungs, uh, then you're in for a very rocky ride. That's a feeling Dr. Fariba Donovan's patient, Renee Benoit, knows well. We met them both at the aptly named Valley Fever Center for Excellence in Tucson. Some people, it disseminates and they get worse. Some people, it kills them. While Benoit has been living with this fungus inside her body for more than a decade. I know that I have valley fever still in my lungs and that it isn't cured, it could reactivate, grow, and perhaps get into your bloodstream, mm -hmm. and God forbid, get into lung and, uh, I'm sorry, brain, and cause meningitis, can go mm -hmm. into skin, mm -hmm. cause a skin infection. It took time for Benoit to get a proper diagnosis, since even in Arizona, frontline medical teams aren't always familiar with valley fever. Her infection is now under control through antifungal treatments, but... Treatment for life means several pills a day, every day for life. Dr. Donovan says her team's goals are educating more clinicians and developing vaccines to prevent rare but life-threatening infections. Unfortunately, those cases get to us when it's already disseminated, when it's already in that complicated stage. Hebert is grateful his case of valley fever was caught early. He took antifungal medications for nine months and likely gained immunity to protect against another infection. But there's also a chance the fungus is still lurking inside his body. Could it, could it reoccur or am I gonna have lasting issues? A concern more and more people could be facing in the years ahead from a health threat hiding right beneath their feet. So, Lauren, Canadians watching tonight might be a little rattled by all of this. Is there cause for concern here now? Well, I don't want people to be alarmed because there's no indication that this fungus is hiding out in Canadian soil right now. But it could be in the years ahead. This is just one of many different infectious diseases around the world that's spreading because of climate change. We have these fungal infections. We have malaria spread by mosquitoes. And here in Canada, we know Lyme disease has been spreading further north because of tick populations adapting to a different climate. All of this is something we have to watch for in the years ahead.
And so how is Canada monitoring these kinds of health threats like valley fever? Well, when it comes to valley fever, cases do come into the country through travel. So the provinces monitor those, they diagnose them. But the Public Health Agency of Canada says there is no national surveillance program, at least not yet. Ian? Lauren Pelly in our Toronto studio this evening. Thank you. Next, the cost of borrowing just got more expensive. Why many Canadians are yet to feel the pain. And a little later, the stunning new image from the world's most powerful space telescope. It's yet another blow to mortgage holders. The Bank of Canada raising its key interest rate again, this time by 25 basis points. At 5% is the highest it's been in more than 20 years. Concern is also pretty high on Canadian streets. I think that people are going to lose their houses. I think that people are going to lose their businesses. A lot of people are just leaving, living pay paycheck to paycheck. So really you're just pricing out the middle class. It definitely makes day-to-day uh, -day life a lot more difficult. Let's bring in CBC senior business correspondent Peter Armstrong. Hey, Peter. Hi, Ian. Uh, give us a little perspective on these rates. Because it, it requires some perspective, right? Like, this is a lot to digest, especially when you think about just how long we were at such rock bottom rates. But, you know, you, you just look at the numbers here. Go back to March of 2022. The bank's rate then was at 0.25%. And since then, we've now seen, what, 10 hikes, some of them by a full percentage point each. This is in the fastest, most aggressive cycle of interest rate hikes this country's ever seen. And today, that brings the bank's rate up to 5%. So as you say, it requires some perspective. It requires some digestion, not just trying to figure out your, your accounts and what this is going to mean for your bills, uh, but just getting your head around such a sharp increase over such a short period of time. And a lot of people watching feel that it requires some explanation, too. Why is this happening? <laughs> Look, it, it's a good question, and it does take a bit of a, a step back because there's something kind of counterintuitive about this. That what the Bank of Canada is doing, and indeed central banks around the world are doing the same thing, of walking something of a tightrope here, trying to use interest rates to slow the economy, right? As those rates rise, households, the me's and the u's of the world, we get squeezed by our higher borrowing costs, and so we buy less stuff. If we buy less stuff, prices should come down. That's the theory. But the flip side of that is every single time those rates go up, you're injecting a little bit more pain into the economy. And from a central bank's perspective, you don't want to slow things so much that you cause an outright recession or you take a, a potential downturn and make that longer and more damaging than it absolutely has to be to get inflation back to target. One of the things I find really interesting is even though you follow all of this really closely, you were surprised. I, I was, and, and that in spite of the fact that literally every economist in the country was saying the bank was going to do this, but I had somehow convinced myself that the bank was going to pause. And, you know, Ian, in my defense, the, the data sure looked like they backed me up on this. You know, remember, the Bank of Canada said that it needed to see progress on three key files. It wanted to see GDP cool down, it wanted job growth to moderate, and obviously it needed inflation itself to decelerate. But look, GDP is down from 3.8% last year to basically zero now. Jobs numbers came in a touch better than expected, but certainly not the kind of blockbuster growth that we saw over the last year. And then just look at how far CPI has fallen from 8 to 7 to 5, now 3.4%. And Ian, we're going to get the latest inflation data next week, and the expectation is that it will cool even further to 3.1%, really then knocking on the door of the target window the bank has. And, you know, not to get too, too in deep in the weeds here, but it generally takes like 18 months for interest rate increases to really work their way into the economy. So I thought the bank would take that time and maybe hike in September if it needed to, but wait and see how this is all playing out. Okay, we'll talk about September in a sec, but, but I'm curious, what impact is this going to have? It's going to have a huge impact, and it, that impact is going to be everywhere. You know, when we think about these changes, one of the first things we think about are people who hold a variable rate mortgage. But look, fixed rate borrowers are coming due too. Two thirds of mortgage holders in this country, Ian, still haven't renewed at these new higher rates. So it's going to hit them. It's going to hit renters as landlords jack up their rents, at least in part, because they say they have to keep up with their own debt payments. And that's not just households, though it's a huge problem for them. I spoke with a bunch of small businesses over the last week or so. People are getting clobbered on their rents. And remember, small businesses make up like 70% of private sector employment in this country. So it really does matter. 
And so, Peter, what comes next? Well, now we're going to get to, to what the data really tell us, right? Because if the argument here is that these rates are going to help bring down growth, then we need to see that start to show up in the data. So we're going to look for GDP data. We're going to look at the jobs data. We're going to get the CPI data, as I said, uh, next week. Uh, and we'll get to see, is the economy really running too hot? And, you know, we're going to be back here talking about rates again in September because the bank left the door open to another rate hike. You know, it said we don't necessarily think the economy is going to slip into a recession, uh, that it's going to hover right around 0%, which is where it is now. But if they sense in that data that we get over the next you know, five, six weeks that it's not doing enough. It said it's going to do what it has to do to get that growth back down uh, and to get inflation back under control. And right now, at this moment, Ian, uh, the, the market swaps are showing that like an 83% chance that the bank will hike again this fall. So there's a lot of moving parts here uh, and we're just going to have to try to keep track of them as they come in. Okay, Peter, always nice talking to you. You bet. Next, a pot of orcas surprises dozens of people on a BC pier. They were directly underneath us, like we could see them right close. Why it left people crying tears of joy in our moment. This stunning image shows dozens of stars being created in a vast cloud complex, some 390 million light years away. It was captured by the Webb Space Telescope. NASA released it today to mark the one-year anniversary of the telescope's first images. NASA says they offer a glimpse of what our solar system would have looked like when it was forming billions of years ago. Whoa! And here's another rare sight. Spectators in BC got a surprising visit this weekend. A pod of orcas swam unusually close to a pier, and with them, a little calf. Orcas don't often bring their calves so close to humans, so for the dozens of onlookers, this was an unbelievable encounter. Tonight, that baby orca is our moment. Oh Hello. my God. Hello. Hello, baby. I cried and I looked around and there was definitely a lot of tears in a lot of people's eyes for sure. When I showed up, there was probably like a hundred people on the pier. And so I went up to someone, I asked, I was like, what's going on? And they said that there was a pod of orca heading right down towards us. It was such a big deal because it's pretty often that we see the orca coming through the strait here in Campbell River, but it is not often that you see them that close to the shore. They were directly underneath us. Your hands are shaking. <laughs> Don't drop your camera. It was chaotic and it was exciting and exhilarating. It was crazy. <laughs> but it's beyond rare for the orca to bring their calves that close to land. Oh my God. The adults were massive. They were the size of like an SUV, like they're big animals. I would say the calf was probably about the size of a porpoise. All I heard was just awe. It was just, wow, this is amazing. This is crazy. So I learned this when I moved out to the West Coast about 30 years ago, and it remains true all these years later. Orcas are showstoppers, whether you're on a ferry or on the coast near Vancouver, or in this case, on a pier, even without the calf, people love orcas. That is the National for July 12th. See you tomorrow night.